So welcome everybody. Today we have Adolfo de Campo from the University of Luxembourg. And as you can read, he will be talking about quantum chaos in open systems and spectral filtering. So whenever you're ready, Adolfo, go ahead. I'm ready. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation and the, present, uh, you know, the presentation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about quantum chaos in open systems. Uh, and uh, with this, I will uh, motivate uh, the, the part on uh, non-Hermitian uh, systems. And for some reason, right now, uh, yeah, right now I can I can swap the slide. Mm -hmm. So this is a group of the uh, Luxembourg. So it's a, a, pic a picture in a sunny day. Uh, this is the uh, postdoc in the group. We have three PhD students, and I work closely with uh, Aurelia, who I think uh, gave a, a talk here maybe a couple of weeks ago. And um, I want to. Yeah, some difficulties. Yeah, so actually in this talk, I'm going to cover a few a set of works. So there's a broad range of collaborators involved. Um, you know, there here are the pictures, but you know, I, I will mention them as I go along. Um, but what I want to do is, you know, to start by uh, considering some general features of uh, the coherence, and in particular, how to estimate the coherence times. And then I will move to a relatively simple setting, that of energy defacing which I will use to discuss how uh, quantum chaos is affected by, uh, by the coherence. Uh, this I will motivate with some spectral form factors and in particular from a, a quantum information theory perspective. And uh, with this understanding at hand, I will move to non-Hermitian systems and in particular with balance gain and loss. So let me start with something very basic and very kind of textbook-like. You know, we want to describe open quantum system, a canonical way of doing it is to uh, embed the system in an environment and uh, consider the unitary evolution in the uh, composite Hilbert space. Uh, of course, this is typically hard to uh, do in practice. Uh, so one uh, traces over the uh, degrees of freedom on the, of the environment and end up with a effective master equation for the uh, reduced density matrix of the system. Now there are well-known results going back to Limblad, uh, you know, for when such uh, master equation can be written in this canonical form, so called uh, uh, Limblad form, in the Markovian limit. Yeah. So I'm, I basically have a, a, a Hamiltonian generating uh, unitary evolution, and on top of it, there is a dissipator of this specific specific form. And uh, you know, one one of the main ingredients and in, uh, the uh, this coupling to an environment things is the coherence. So I just go back to very old results by Wojciech Surek and others uh, that consider, for instance, what happens when you prepare a wave packet in a superposition between two points in a space and you look at the density matrix here versus X and X uh, prime. And uh, there you see that there are elements, uh, you know, this is an initial uh, pure state, uh, the density matrix of the pure state of a kind of Schrodinger cut. And if you couple it to a given kind of bath, which uh, you know, in particular, the, what they consider in the seminal works was quantum Brownian motion, where you have defacing in position, plus this term, which is you know, it's more non-trivial. But you know, if you just consider the case of large temperatures, uh, the main effect is going to be given by, by this double commutator, which is a very simple uh, uh, dissipative channel uh, inducing defacing. What you see is that the uh, coherences in the uh, density matrix uh, in the basis of the uh, operator involved here are suppressed yes, as a function of time. So you have a coherent state and it decoheres and only the uh, classical part survives, so to speak. Indeed, you know, you can do asymptotic analysis at short times to approximate the time dependent density matrix by its initial value time a, a, a factor which decays exponentially uh, with the uh, dispersion in the, in the eigenbasis. And doing this kind of analysis, uh, Surek uh, identified that the, the coherence time scale under uh, this model of quantum Brownian motion had a very beautiful, simple expression, which is essentially you take the, the size of your Schrodinger cut, delta x, you measure it in units of the de Broglie wavelength, uh, this lambda beta, and uh, the square of the inverse of this gives you the, the coherence time. So that was a cute result, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a seminal result uh, very early on in the theory of the coherence. Uh, but the, all this is very basis dependent. So one of the things we wanted to do is to extend this to a, an arbitrary uh, Markovian master equation. And in order to do that, we look at the quantities, you know, we, we wanted to do a, a basis independent computation. So we introduced the purity of the reduced density metrics. 
and uh, just look at uh, the general limb blood master equation. And what you can do is uh, to study the short term uh, behavior of the purity. And you can show that at short times the purity always uh, behaves in this form. Uh, it kind of this looks like the short time expansion of an exponential, where d uh, is what we are going to call the, the coherence rate. Yeah? So the coherence rate you can relate it to the d capital e. You can relate it to the, the coherence time. And uh, the beautiful thing is that for any Lindblad master equation, we can come up with this expression uh, for what's the cover, you know, the, the coherence time in terms of the covariance of the Lindblad operators evaluated in the initial state uh, of the system. Yeah? Uh, so you know, this just comes from a, this is a trivial uh, expansion where you just uh, do a Taylor expansion of the purity and you use the derivative uh, to, to give the first, the first order term. So this is something we, we uh, reported a few years back. And of course, uh, we can now revisit the problem of uh, uh, quantum Brownian motion. And uh, with this uh, expression for the decoherence time, we recover the estimate by Surek. Uh, but you know, we're not, we not restricted to this. Uh, we can do it for an arbitrary Lindblad master equation. Okay, so this, this is a bit just um, you know, as a warm up. Uh, so what I want to do next is to introduce some relatively esoteric family of uh, Lindbladians of, of the phasing operators. And in order to do that, I'm going to justify them using the theory of stochastic Hamiltonians, where essentially my, I will consider an isolated system described by a Hamiltonian H of T, which has some uh, time dependent part, which is deterministic. But there is going to be uh, another operator, which in principle, I'm just going to take it time independent, but it is coupled to a, a real Gaussian process, it will be a fluctuating, a fluctuating uh, Gaussian process. Well, you know, this is still a Hamiltonian. I can look at the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And for any given realization of the noise, in principle, I can integrate this equation and uh, uh, find a trajectory. This, this is one thing you can do, for instance, numerically, but uh, there are, there's an alternative approach, which is uh, based on considering the average over many realizations of the noise. And I refer you to early works by Gerard Milburn and others. Um, some very nice ones written by Boudini and you know, our work in 2017. Uh, so what we do is to uh, consider uh, stochastic trajectories for a given realization of gamma. And we average now over different realizations of the nodes. So you know, we, we still have an isolated system uh, and we run it for a given uh, noisy realization. And we run the experiment again, we run the experiment again, and we uh, ensemble over all the pure states. In that way, we construct a noise average density matrix, no longer a pure state. And uh, the equation of motion for this uh, noise average density matrix is given here. So it looks you know, like it has a, a von Neumann part, and it has a kind of a non-Markovian relatively uh, nasty uh, dissipator, which depends on the single stochastic trajectories. Uh, so in principle, this is hard, hard to solve, and it looks like we have not gained much unless we consider the limit of white noise limit where this is correlated uh, uh, with, with a delta function. And if we call W the strength of the noise, then with no approximations in an exact form, we end up with a very trivial, uh, simple uh, defacing master equation. Yeah? So what is crucial here is that this was the deterministic part of the Hamiltonian. B, which was the fluctuating operator comes out here in this double commutator. This is just defacing, so we expect it to suppress coherences in the eigenbasis of B. And what is important, you know, for those coming from traditional theory of quantum open systems, is that this derivation is valid for any any value of W. It's not limited to weak coupling, as in the standard theory of open systems. Uh, good. So I'm going to use this to justify a, a kind of dissipators that you will see now that will get a bit funny. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you know. For the sake of illustration, let me consider a, a model that we can realize in several quantum simulators, such as the transverse field listening model, where we have spins interacting with some uh, ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic uh, couplings, and there's a magnetic field which couples to the magnetization. This can be done with trapped ions, uh, as in the experience of Chris Monroe, or in many other experiments. And what I want to do is now imagine what happens if I add noise to the magnetic field. Uh, so the, this whole magnetization will be the fluctuating operator. And therefore, I can end up with a master equation in which the dissipator is going to be the double commutator of the magnetization, which you know, I can write as a double sum 
over the single spins uh, acting on the uh, noise average density matrix. Now, if I use the uh, cute formula I gave you for the decoherence time, I can uh, predict how uh, the decoherence time is going to scale with the system size. You know, I'm coupling noise to a, a magnetic field which acts over all the spins. So if all of them are being shaken by this uh, fluctuating field, um, I can ask you know, if I increase the system size, how, how the decoherence time is going to be suppressed. And it's just going to be a, a, a suppression polynomial of, uh, of, of this form of second order. So that's what happens when we add noise to the magnetic field, but we can also add noise to the spin-spin uh, uh, interactions. And say, if we do it globally, so that uh, again, globally, we uh, tune all of them at once, uh, we end up with a, a, a dissipator, which essentially is, you know, this, 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 this is the fluctuating operator, and we end up with having four indices and uh, or something we can maybe call, uh, I'm using the notation a bit, a uh, four body dissipator. Now, if you use the formula we uh, derive in terms of the covariance of the fluctuating limb blood operators, uh, uh, then you would see that the decoherence time is suppressed with a polynomial of order four with the system size. Uh, so, you know, this we did for, in, in the easy model, you have just one body and two body operators. So this is uh, as much fun as you can have. So, you know, let me consider now a uh, uh, stochastic Hamiltonian, which has some deterministic part and some Limbladian operators that for fun, I'm going to assume that are not just one body or two body, but can be arbitrarily K body operators, yes? So, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, this, is, uh, this is something reasonable in the context of quantum simulators. So in this case, what I find is, you know, I have the phasing with this global uh, symmetrized uh, fluctuating operator. And, uh, you know, essentially I can write what will be the dissipator. And I can also predict what will be the, the coherence uh, time associated with this uh, defacing channel. And perhaps not surprisingly, as you could have guessed, uh, it, it decays exponentially, uh, you know, polynomially with the system size to twice the, the, the degree of the rank of, the, of, the, of this uh, oper fluctuating operator. Good. So we have this prediction, you know, we, we can engineer this crazy uh, many body uh, defacing operators and we induce fast, fast uh, polynomial uh, uh, decay of the coherence time with the system size. Uh, is this all what is there? Can one get something beyond this? And this is the question we, we, we ask, you know, what are the ultimate bounds on the decoherence time? How fast, how crazy can one get you know, in, 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 in this, uh, decay of coherences of, of the density matrix. And for that, we play again, you know, which uh, is to assume that these are uh, random operators uh, sampled from, you know, a, a given ensemble, and uh, in particular, the Gaussian unitary ensemble or the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So we have a, a, a Hamiltonian in a given uh, Hilbert space dimension, and we consider full rank uh, defacing operators. And in that case, what we can show, uh, well, I mean, Technically, uh, it becomes a bit, um, you know, you just have to do the standard averages with random matrices. There's a prescription of how to do it. So if you want to average a given fun function of a given operator, you, you, the way you do it in a given ensemble, say in the Gaussian unitary ensemble, is you uh, average over the eigenvalue uh, distribution, D function, I mean, D point function, and you perform the hard average uh, with respect to the unitary group. Now, when you do this calculation, I mean, this is the calculation you need to do to compute the, uh, the coherence rate uh, for fluctuating operators uh, average over the Gaussian unitary ensemble. Uh, and what you find, essentially, the short story is that you get an expression which is proportional to the Hilbert space dimension. Um, so you get a global coupling, which is just the sum of the couplings of the fluctuating operators in the Limbaugh equation. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is that, uh, you know, essentially the decoherence time is just the sum of the variance of the Limbaugh operators. And because now we are sampling these Limbaugh operators from the Gaussian unitary ensemble, we get that there's a, uh, I don't know where you can see it because I have my, 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 my picture in front, but you know, it's an exponential on the system side. So the coherence rate is uh, goes like two to the end. So the coherence time is no, not suppressed polynomially, it's suppressed exponentially in the system size. And this we can prove that it is the fastest you can have. Uh, there's no other possible scaling that uh, will beat this, this bound. Yeah. Uh, the proof um, uh, we, uh, is reported here. Essentially, you just use uh, triangle inequalities and bound the operators. And you can show that the, the coherence time 
uh, you know, in general, is for a cable fluctuating operator is it's polynomial, but you know, the fastest you can go is is exponential when k is, pro is is dependent on the on the system size, which is what happens in the case of random metric theory. Good. So let, let me illustrate this a bit with an example. You know, so this was a bit the theory without working out anything in detail. So let me now work out a problem which is very simple, but let me work it out in detail. So I consider a, a bipartite system with two, you know, with two identical copies. You know, one uh, that, that they are not interacting. So you say I have two atoms. Uh, well, you know, so I have the Hamiltonian of one, I have the Hamiltonian of the other, and now I consider the phasing which is uh, local. Yeah. So each of them are sub being subject to local defacing operators, one acting on, say, on the left copy, or other acting on the right copy. And the only correlations come from the initial state. So I consider an entangled state so, uh, between the two copies. And just for fun, for simplicity, let me consider the, what is called the thermophile double state, which is just an um, entangled state. You know, if I take beta to be uh, zero, then this will be a maximally entangled state between the two systems. Otherwise, it's just uh, a nice family of entangled states because it's parameterized with a single parameter beta. Uh, you know, this state is also uh, what you get by purifying an equilibrium density matrix of a single copy. Uh, you know, you purify it by uh, looking at a bigger Hilbert space now of two copies. And if I, you trace over any of the two copies, you get a certain state of one copy. Yeah. Good. So for, let, let's look at the uh, defacing dynamics of, of this system. And what you see is, well, you can work out explicitly what's the time evolution of the density matrix. It does have the Boltzmann factors, uh, and there's a dynamical phase. And the phasing, you see it here, is the phasing in the energy again basis. It suppresses the uh, exponential in time, the coherences in the in the energy eigen basis. Um, this allows you, you know, this is a relatively simple expression. If you compute things such as the purity, uh, you can see that the purity uh, as a function of time is given by this simple expression in terms of the uh, partition function at complex uh, temperature where beta is replaced by beta minus i y and you are integrating over y with a, a Gaussian kernel which encodes the effect of the coherence yeah uh, uh, so from so we, we will see this structure appearing recurrently in this talk because this is re related to a spectral form factor which is a quantity using quantum chaos for diagnosis of whether a system is chaotic or integrable and so on. So the appearance of the analytically continuum partition functions here is, is uh, something important that will come out later again. Uh, but you know, we, we have the purity exactly computed at all times. Of course, from the short time expansion, we can get the, the coherence time. And we, in this case, is just going to be proportional to the energy fluctuations. Um, and what you see is, you know, this is an example of uh, what's called a unital map. Uh, so it's uh, the, the dynamics is unital, and it, it, there's a theorem by Daniel Lidar, Salvani, and Aliski that tells you that the uh, purity is going to decay monotonically as a function of time. Uh, it's not possible for the purity to increase; it has to decay monotonically. And you see here the behavior for two different temperatures. If the uh, initial temperature is high, so then you decay to, to a lower value. Yeah. Good. Um, so, so can we have, you know, do, do we have the extreme decoherence here? So in order to see it, we plot the scaling of the decoherence rate versus the uh, system size. And we do it in a double logarithmic scale. And we see that in effect, we find this uh, exponential dependence on the system size uh, in a double logarithmic scale, yes, a straight line, either, uh, you know, when the temperatures are uh, uh, when the system size is small or the temperatures are uh, high, you know. So, so in the, in the for beta equal zero, we do have uh, um, this extreme decoherence at all for all system sizes. If the temperature is finite, we see that for this initial state, there is a maximum uh, system size below which the the coherence rate is constant and independent of the system size. And we can, you know, we, we understand this. And we have the, the critical value at which this happens. But uh, you know, essentially, we want to see where extreme decoherence can hold in, in a given system. We we see that we are either restricted to to uh, maximally entangled states. So uh, this is infinite temperature. It means that the initial state, the thermophile double, is essentially a maximally entangled state, or the system size is small. You know, for to see this this uh, exponential problem. Good. So, th so this is a bit uh, a story I wanted to, uh, to to tell you, in which we have considered the effect of uh, having 
uh, defacing at the level of k local Limbladian operators and how this gave rise to a polynomial suppression of the decohesion time with the system size. Uh, if by, contract, by contrast, we consider fully, full rank essentially uh, uh, defacing operators like in random metric theory, this gave rise to uh, a exponential uh, suppression of the decohesion time with the system size. So in the thermodynamic limit, this will give you uh, vanishing coherences you know, like immediately. Good. So, so I want to move a bit now to the part of spec, uh, quantum chaos. So I mentioned that the, 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 the spectral form factor is related to the analytically continued partition function that already appear here. So I put this picture of New Mexico uh, with the, the mesas and the, the dips and the, the plateaus, because this is the typical features that the spectral form factor uh, exhibit. So I, I think at least Julia will recognize this picture. Uh, it's taken at Los Alamos. Good. So this, the theory of uh, quantum chaos and open systems is, you know, is, is, a, is a subject of a study that has a long history. You can read about it in the famous book by Fritz Hacke. Uh, there's other books focused on it uh, with a semi-classical treatment. Uh, but the take I'm, I'm going to, you know, the seminal works by Wojciech uh, Surekan and others. But I'm going to take a very specific take on on uh, on chaos uh, by focusing exclusively on spectral statistics, on the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, the distribution of eigenvalues in, in chaotic systems, and only see how the effect of a given uh, the coherence of making the system open affects the signatures of the spectral statistics. So this is work with Aurelia and Thomas Prosen and Saint Yusuf. <clears throat> so uh, let's go a bit back in history. So, you know, it's uh, a while back, uh, our works in the 80s and 90s, People realize that if you want to uh, that tell whether a given system is chaotic or not, one of the things you can do is to uh, plot the eigenvalue, the set of eigenvalues, mm -hmm. and uh, Fourier transform it. And uh, actually, uh, you can the Fourier transform is essentially related to uh, the what is called the survival probability. So you take an initial state which has a broad uh, 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 support in the energy space. Uh, so essentially it has non-zero components over the whole spectrum. Uh, you time evolve it with your system Hamiltonian and you project, it back, you project it back into the initial state. So this is the survival amplitude. And people already realize that this quantity has important uh, features depending whether the system is integrable or chaotic. In particular, if it is chaotic, you expect that uh, this quantity decays from, it's a, it's a probability, it decays from unit value, it has a dip uh, and then there's a ramp and a plateau. And I, again, I don't know how much you can see from these pictures at the left of the, at the right of the slide, but I, I will show more. Now, th this idea has been resuscitated in the last few years. Uh, you may have seen lots of works on quantum chaos, in particular motivated by high energy physics and the study of uh, ADSFT models in, and, and, and in particular, uh, the idea that um, some, some of these can capture physics of black holes and black holes are maximally chaotic. So there was the famous work by Malacena, Senker, and Stanford on bounds on chaos. And uh, in, in, you know, some of these uh, studies motivated you know, uh, changed a bit, a bit the emphasis. So they started to look at this object, which is just the absolute square value of the partition function when the temperature is uh, analytically continued to the complex plane, and you take beta, instead of beta, beta plus it. And you know, I don't know what this is apparent to you, but you know, uh, there's a direct relation between these two quantities that we discussed at length in, in this work, in this PRD, uh, which is essentially, th this expression is just, uh, can be recasted as a survival, ampli uh, survival probability of a state such as the one I presented before, which is the thermophile double state, or even a coherent Gibbs state of a single copy. Uh, <clears throat> So let me, let me uh, motivate a bit the physics of, of these quantities. Yes, why are these interesting to uh, reflect properties of the spectrum of a given system? So one, one thing you can do is to look at the survival amplitudes and realize that this is just the Fourier transform of the density of states, or the density of states is just given by you know, a bunch of deltas pick up at the eigenvalues with the corresponding uh, coefficients. Yes. Now, this is just the survival amplitude. You want the uh, fidelity, so the absolute square value of the of survival probability. Then you have a double integral. You, know, you just take the square of this, you have a double integral. And if you are taking an average over a given ensemble, uh, then you see that you need to average uh, this uh, 
product of the density of the states are two different energies. Adolfo, <coughs> so, Adolfo yep. Fe Federico had a question. Now he put it back, Federico, the question. Oh, Federico, oh, yeah, 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 no, I, uh, I think you answered this. I was wondering uh, what uh, this average was, so in two slides before. Yeah, so here I just want to make the case that you know you, you could have a condensed matter system that is disorder. In that case, you pull average over disorder. You are thinking more like a, you know, from the community of random metric theory. You typically have an ensemble of Hamiltonians uh, that obey some symmetries, um, and you will just average over that ensemble. Well, you know, so so we just average over many realizations of a or different realization of a, over a distribution of Hamiltonians. This is the idea. We have a system that perhaps is not characterized uniquely by a given Hamiltonian. We don't have enough information, or we have many copies of the same system with a slight, a slight differences, maybe disorder or uh, you know something like this. Yeah. So I, ho I hope that clarifies it. Yeah. So now, now when we look at the survival probability or fidelity average over an ensemble, it is interesting to see the different contributions that uh, appear in the exact expression. So we unfold this general expression a bit into something that is not very informative because this is going to be the Fourier transform of the average of the density of the states over that ensemble. This is informative, uh, but not universal, and is not related to chaos. What is crucial for chaos is this second term, is the fact that uh, it depends on the uh, uh, connected uh, two-point uh, uh, two uh, uh, distribution. So, you know, it's essentially the this, this quantity captures the correlations between eigenvalues. Uh, if the, uh, there are no correlations, this, you know, if, if, if this is equal to the uh, product of the averages, this term will be zero. And then there's finally a constant value, which I don't know where you can see, uh, but it's just a plateau. So let me show this in, 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 in pictures. Yes. So imagine you take a, a, a given a chaotic uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, in, in this particular example, I, I take a model. I will explain it a bit later, so-called sagleb yikitayev model. Now you could take a disorder spin chain or a single random matrix. And you will see something like this. If you plot the fidelity as a function of time, you will see that it starts at uh, unit value for an uh, ET case. Uh, there are some uh, fluctuations, uh, kind of there's a deep a minimum value. There's lots of noise. Uh, there are lots of coherences that uh, at long times become very quickly oscillating. And uh, here there's a very interesting part, which is kind of a ramp, and eventually there's a plateau. This is for a single realization. I'm very messy. If you look at now at one of these ensembles, you know you perform the ensemble average. Uh, what you see is you know much cleaner uh, features. Some of the oscillations are are physical, are there. They remain. There's a tip, then there's a, a ramp, and then there's the plateau. And <clears throat> the three expressions that I gave you here, you know, the, the, this part, the correlated part, and the plateau, uh, appear in this uh, picture and essentially give you. Uh, govern the different parts. Yes, the, 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 the disconnected part governs the short time decay. The uh, eigenvalue correlations uh, are the part which is associated with quantum chaos and are give rise to this ramp. And then we have a plateau at long times, which is just a, essentially a constant. Good. So, <clears throat> yeah. By the way, this this you know this uh, quick oscillations. Uh, have different names in the literature, sometimes are called quantum noise, although this is related to the quantum noise I mentioned before. Uh, but you know, it's just co coherences that oscillate quickly uh, in, in, in the, uh, as a function of time. Well, so, uh, you know, also to fix the terminology, I would refer to this part as the dip. You know, so this is kind of the minimum value of the uh, fidelity. Uh, there's the ramp, which is this uh, part that stems from correlations between eigenvalues in the system. And there's the plateau. And uh, by the way, you know this is uh, this, this general features of the spectral form factor or the fidelity have been uh, have appeared in different contexts, going from lossmith echoes to NMR experiments and high energy physics. <clears throat> now, the part which is perhaps more interesting is this this ramp, which is the one that stems, as I mentioned, from the cor correlations uh, between eigenvalues. And you know, there's at least this work that pointed out that the extent of the ramp uh, is you uh, can be used to quantify. Uh, the degree of uh, of chaoticity in the system. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So, so, so now it's you know all this is for isolated systems. All this is known. I want to uh, study how chaos is modified in in the presence of open systems when you have the coherence, and uh, you know. So then, what what replaces the spectral form factor 
for open quantum systems. Yes. So this is a matter of debate, ongoing research, and you know some people just say, well, you know, I will have uh, complex eigenvalues in a dissipative system, so I will just take the Fourier transform and look at it. Well, fine. And no, I don't think this is particularly good uh, because it includes some physical uh, correlations. Uh, you know, so my take, uh, which I already is present in uh, the talk so far, is that we, sh we should follow a, a fidelity-based approach, a quantum information approach, where we look at the uh, survival probability of a given state under any given dynamics. And we don't care whether the system is open, non Hermitian, isolated. We will always use the same consistent definition of the spectral form factor and understand physically what is uh, happening uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to the spectral form factor under different dynamics. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so this is something we have you know, been pushing a number of papers with, uh, with Sonner, with Takayanagi, with Sen Yusu, Prosen, and others. Uh, so let me uh, mention it you know, on, on very simple terms. Yes. So we justify you know, so that uh, the initial state uh, that should be taken is a state of this form which is a state which is just a coherent superposition in the energy eigenbasis, with, which is full rank. And it just you know, doesn't have to be a coherent GFS state. This is essentially a square root of a Boltzmann factor, but it just proves very convenient, as you will see why. Now, given this initial state, what I'm going to do is take any quantum channel. And I, again, I don't care whether the system is unitary, open or non-Hermitian or fluctuating. Uh, I will always just consider the evolution of this, uh, of this initial state get a time dependent state and define the spectral form factor as the survival probability of the time dependent state on the initial state. Yeah. So, so, so I, I guess I motivated this from a historical perspective and from a quantum information perspective. Why this is a good idea? Well, at the very least, if the dynamics is uh, isolated, then I will, you know, I, I, in this case, my channel is just conjugation by a unitary and I do get back the standard definition of the spectral form factor being the absolute square value of the analytically continued partition function. I have a question, uh, Adolfo. Yep. I have a question. Since you are now dealing with non-emission systems, should you not redefine your density matrix and distinguish left eigenstates from right eigenstates? All right. So, so I'm not yet going to know Hermitian. So oh, far, okay. I'm just going to open. Oh. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I have a, a you know, I have an open system, and I will. Uh, I, I have a, I have a state. And I propagate it with arbitrary dynamics. Yes, but you know, I guess this. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Thank you. Right. So, so you know, you know, so if the dynamics is unitary. It's just the all result. If it's open, we just have this this kind of expression. Yes. And okay. So everything I said so far was uh, you know in this uh, brief generalization, and I made emphasis on a single copy. Uh, what's the thermofield double state? Well, it's the same, but instead of having one copy, we have two copies. This is of interest in given the scenarios if you want to uh, ask about uh, correlations between multiple copies. Uh, but you know, uh, the, the time evolution is also known, and the uh, survival probability of the thermofield double state at time p is just essentially the partition function. With the only thing that changes here is a factor of two. Good. Uh, so for open systems, this is the idea. You know, I will take a thermofield level. If I have multiple copies, I propagate it in time with a quantum channel, and I look at the survival probability uh, at a later time. You know, and this I define as a spectral form factor. So let's see where this definition makes sense, where it is good, where and you know what are the advantages of this. Uh, and for that, let me let me go to an example. Yeah? So the example I'm going to choose is essentially the same one I chose before. I have two independent copies, and each of them are fluctuating. Uh, with some, you know, so, so I are subject to local defacing, yes. So these BKs act locally on each of the copies. I do have in closed form, um, dynamics is very simple. I do have the time dependent density matrix. I can compute the spectral form factor. Already you see here, uh, interestingly, what's the effect of the uh, defacing. So if you set this equal to zero, this will be the analytically continued partition function in iso or, or, or of the system in isolation, the absolute square value of the partition function. Now, the effect of the coherence is manifestly to suppress the, any, any coherences in the, in the energy eigenbasis. We, just by looking at this expression, we can also confirm that the plateau, that the asymptotic value at long times, it is unchanged by this kind of uh, defacing. And uh, right, so uh, okay, so and uh, so that, you know, from a mathematical point of view, we can we can do something cute, which is to realize, as I mentioned before, for the purity for the spectral form factor, 
It is also true that I can write the spectral form factor of an open system in terms of that of an isolated system. Here, G beta is just uh, the absolute square value of the partition function times a kernel. Yeah? So all, all what this defacing is doing is to course graining in time the spectral form factor of an isolated system. It's a, arguably a simple model of defacing. It's only true for energy defacing. Uh, but what we do is to take the spectral form factor of the system in isolation. We kind of record a movie and take the average, and this is with a given kernel, and this is what happens to the uh, spectral form factor in the open system. Um, okay, so so I want to go to the to the numerics, but let me give you. We can do this for other quantities, such as the logarithmic negativity. This uh, this is an entanglement monotone. We can compute it exactly. And what is yes, important beyond the exact expression is that we can relate it again to the spectral form factor of the system in isolation times a kernel times some other function. Yeah? If we look at Rennie entropies, the same thing happens. We can compute them exactly. And if we know the partition function analytically continue, we can get them back. Yeah? So this is when we choose this family of initial states for the definition of the spectral form factor. Good. So now we go to the numerics, and I choose the the, the same the the Sagler Gikitayev model, which is one of the uh, test beds for quantum chaos. It has a system of Majorana fermions with four-body all-to-all interactions. But anything that I'm going to solve does not require the Sagler Gikitayev model. If you take a, if you take a random matrix Hamiltonian or a, a chaotic disorder spin chain, you will see exactly the same thing. Uh, so, you know, I, I, so I take two copies of the system, I prepare an entangled state, I subject it to energy defacing, as I described, and I look at what happens, for instance, to the logarithmic negativity. Not surprisingly, you know, if uh, uh, gamma is the strength of the dissipation, if there's no dissipation, logarithmic negativity is invariant under unitary time evolution. If I crank up dissipation, you see that it starts to decay monotonically. And this is what you expect. You have an entangled state uh, you, in the energy representation. You subject it to local defacing. You should lose entanglement. Uh, if you look at Rennie entropies, for instance, the, pure, you know, the, the second one, which related to the purity, then uh, the converse happens. It increases monotonically because you started with a pure state and you are preparing a, a essentially to, uh, to thermal equilibrium states. Good. So, you know, these quantities just do what they are supposed to do. Let's now look at the fidelity uh, as a generalization of the spectral form factor for open systems. And I think here, this is where the interesting uh, things happen. Yeah. So, you know, I plot it uh, in dark blue for the system in isolation, where you see the decay towards a dip, there's the ramp and the plateau. This is for a single copy without uh, any ensemble average. And as soon as I crank up the, uh, the, the facing, then you see several things. First, even with a single copy of the system, all the fluctuations disappear. All of the quantum noise in the uh, jargon by Rabinovici is gone. Yeah, uh, and you know, which shows that this noise is just associated with the uh, coherence in the energy eigenbasis, which the phasing is killing. What you also see is that the plateau is completely unchanged by the effect of the phasing. Uh, the deep, uh, the onset of the deep is shifted to longer times, but the ramp itself is not very much affected. You know, beyond the suppression of the uh, oscillatory fluctuations, the ramp itself is untouched. So the effect of the phasing is just to reduce the extension of the ramp, which is what uh, we had associated uh, with a signature of the extent of chaos to quantify chaos based on earlier work by by B, uh, and Prosen and so on. Uh, so these are the main features, you know, the dip becomes shallower, the, the, the dip shifts to longer time, so it becomes shallower with respect to the plateau, uh, quantum noise is gone, and the extension of the ramp is shortened, yeah, while well, the robust is unchanged, yeah. Uh, this was for a single realization, so if you average it for many realizations, you see even more prominently, of course, now, even, even in the system in isolation, if you average over an ensemble, the fluctuations disappear, and you see very cleanly what is the effect of this defacing, which is just shifting uh, the, the deep and making it uh, shallower. Uh, <clears throat> so, well, you know, so, 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 so uh, what, you know, what, how can you explain these figures? So there are only three times scale in these problems. Two come from the standard theory of uh, chaotic systems. Uh, to give them sim simple names, you know, one is the plateau time, the other is the deep time. And of course, the coherence is bringing the new time scale that we have characterized through this formula uh, with the covariance of the fluctuating limb lab operators. Uh, and, and, you know, for, for a given model, we can compute all, all these time scales. It doesn't matter what they are. But we know 
you, we know them, we can compute them, and essentially we can study what uh, we can predict what we'll see in, in this spectral form factor in the in, in an open system. Yeah. Um, there may be a question as to what happens if the, we don't have an early defacing, we'll have some other kind of defacing. And then uh, this complete, uh, it's a very natural question. We have completely focused on energy defacing. And the reason is if, if you deface in a, on a different basis, which uh, you know does not commute with the system Hamiltonian, uh, what you see is very boring. It's just decay to, towards the plateau. There's absolutely no signature of chaos. So you know, uh, defacing on different eigenbases uh, kills chaos completely, kills signatures of chaos completely. Defacing in the energy eigenbases suppresses chaos, suppresses the dynamical manifestations of chaos gradually yeah, in, in the form I have shown here. So, right, so I guess this is the main message uh, of in, in, the, in this part of the talk. Good. Right, so I'm moving, I don't know how am I doing with time, but essentially I'm moving to the last part of the talk, where now we are going to move to, uh, to consider a simple case of uh, non-Hermitian dynamics uh, with balance gain and loss. And this is based on a, uh, on a preprint with Julian Cornelius as first author. Um, right, so I, I'm, I'm going to motivate uh, non-Hermitian systems again from the standard theory of open quantum systems. So I will assume I have a Limblad master equation and it is a standard uh, to, uh, to rewrite it in terms of an uh, effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian and a quantum jump term. So, you know, so I can take this anti-commutator and add it up here and I get this effective non-Hermitian term. And this is the so-called quantum jump term, J uh, rho, uh, which I can separate. Yeah? So it's just a rewriting of the master equations. Now, <clears throat> this rewriting is natural in the theory of continuous quantum measurements where I'm allowed to essentially monitor the system and I have the ability to see when a uh, quantum jump term occurs. So, you know, there's a, a whole theory of continuous quantum measurements and uh, this can be done in several experimental realizations. There are prominent groups uh, by uh, Michel de Boré and Irfan Siddiqui and uh, Kater Moore and others who have this ability to, you know, in a given experimental setup, trace uh, when quantum jumps occur. So essentially you can do experiments and you can now do post selection. So you see a quantum jump, uh, you can select that trajectory or you can throw it out, away depending on what you want to do. One of the things you can do uh, is condition the dynamics on the absence of quantum jumps. So you assume that this term never has an action on, on the dynamics. Yes? So you, you, you run many experiments and you post select trajectories that lack, uh, uh, lack quantum jumps. Uh, this again is not something new. It's, you can find it in a famous textbook by Howard Carmichael, uh, so-called uh, null measurement conditioning. What it is remarkable is that the master equation that appears for these post-selected trajectories um, is precisely the same equation which was written by Brody and Reife for uh, uh, non-Hermitian dynamics subject to balance gain and loss. So I, we have the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. We know that such no Hermitian Hamiltonian does not preserve norm. And you can mathematically in a ad hoc fashion just enforce the preservation of norm by adding precisely the loss, no, norm loss term uh, times the state. Yeah? And you get uh, an equation which appears to be nonlinear um, in, in, in some sense it is, but it's a very simple kind of nonlinearity where this whole term stems only from the uh, uh, preservation of norm associated with the uh, losses uh, that you have. So, you, know, so you, you have losses, you are canceling these losses by imposing gains, or you have gains and you are canceling the gains with losses, and that gives rise to this uh, master equation. Good. So <clears throat> it's the, this, this is the setting we are going to consider. Uh, it's not the, uh, you know, we, we can discuss later about what, you know, uh, in, in, in other settings, but you know, I'm just going to do uh, uh, this measurement post selection of trajectories in the case of energy defacing. So this is the one which is uh, better to study chaos, and you will see what are the actual advantages of using this post selection. So, what, what I want to sell essentially to present to you is that balance gain and loss can be used as a tool to diagnose uh, correlations in the energy spectrum and to, in particular, to diagnose chaos. So, I'm not, I'm proposing it as a, as a tool, you know, as a, 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 a tool that can be applied both to experiments and to num numerical analysis of chaotic systems. So even if you think that the energy defacing is a very concocted 
uh, kind of master equation, uh, I will show that it has the, the advantages. So that's why we will move to filtering of the spectrum. Yeah? So, but we are going to use a physically motivated filtering. So let me just start by considering that I just have energy defacing, defacing as in the rest of the talk. And now I post select on the absence of quantum jump. So I get this very simple, uh, you know, null measurement conditioning uh, master equation uh, where the effective Hamiltonian is, yes, the Hamiltonian itself uh, with a, a anti-Hermitian part, which is just the square, uh, square part of the Hamiltonian. Now, uh, so happens that, you know, this, again, as I mentioned before, uh, this non-linearity is not dangerous from the point of view that it, it, one can still do uh, progress uh, because the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian has this simple form. You can initially disregard the effect of this non-linearity and solve what will be the evolution governed by this non-Hermitian part. And what you will get is the denominator, or the numerator here. Yeah? So you will get the, the initial density matrix acquires a dynamical phase. And now instead of having a, a Gaussian on the distance between eigenvalues, which is what we got for the phasing, we see that each eigenvalue decays uh, with its magnitude. Yeah? So it's not a surprise. This is the effect of this anti hermitian part. Now, if you uh, account for nonlinearity, this is equivalent to enforce uh, a trace preserving evolution, and that gives you the uh, denominator in this expression. So this is a time dependent uh, density matrix. Uh, you know, this is a simple case. I don't have to worry about left and right eigenvectors. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a time dependent state. <clears throat> I can now use my uh, definition of the spectral form factor and consider a coherent Gibbs state. Uh, look at the time dependent state and uh, look at the survival probability of the time dependent state on the initial state. And what I find is that the, that the uh, natural generalization of the spectral form factor and their energy facing subject to balance gain and loss is given by this expression. Well, it's particularly simple, I would say, uh, but let's see where, where, where this is actually uh, of any use in the context of spectral filtering. Yeah? So, you know, if again, if we kill all these gammas, we will just get back to the standard result for the system in isolation. One important thing is that <clears throat> to compute the spectral form factor in this uh, scenario, the only thing I need to know is the partition function at complex temperature. And this we can show explicitly. So, you know, if we can rewrite the spectral form factor or the fidelity, if we know the uh, partition function at complex uh, temperature, beta plus is, just using a kernel, which is again a, a different kind of Gaussian kernel, I can uh, rewrite the whole fidelity. Uh, the numerator is particularly simple. The denominator is a bit more complicated, but is again, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can, you know, not knowledge of the partition function at complex temperature allow me to compute the uh, spectral form factor in this setting. And why this is good? Okay, so let's see why this is good. <clears throat> so this is what happens, you know, for, for uh, the, the, uh, how the spectral form factor behaves as a function of time. Uh, I do it here for two different values of beta. Uh, so for beta equals zero, which is infinite temperature, so this corresponds uh, to the maximally entangled state at time equals zero. Uh, what I see is that as a function of gamma, uh, well, you know, uh, initially I have the, the result for, for the system in isolation, and uh, uh, which has a dip here. What is interesting, and it's a bit hidden in this, uh, in this part of the plot, is that there, there is a particular value of gamma which, for which the early part has decay to a deeper value. So it has advanced the, uh, the onset of the dip. It has made the dip deeper. And now I have a more prolonged ramp. Yeah? So essentially, this is enhancing the dynamical manifestations of eigenvalue correlations of chaos. Yeah? The rest, uh, you know, for larger values of gamma, you see the same effect as for energy defacing. Uh, the, the, the deep is not advanced with respect to the unitary case, it is delayed. So, you know, in some sense, this is not interesting because this is what we know that uh, happens in the energy defacing. It suppresses mani ma uh, manifestations of chaos. What we want to do is to enhance manifestation of chaos so that we can better identify when a system is chaotic or not using just uh, uh, the Fourier transform of the energy spectrum. Now, uh, what is, is it's even more remarkable is if we uh, change the initial state. So now it doesn't have uh, full support in the whole, uh, you know, that doesn't have a constant support in the whole spectrum. So we put some, some uh, beta acts here as a filter around uh, energy equals zero. So you sample the bulk of the spectrum. Uh, what you see is that in general, you know, so you can shift the, the value of the plateau 
from the value in isolation, it can decay a lot. But what happens is a small ramp that you have here, now it can become enhanced by a large, uh, you know, but you know, these are several orders of magnitude that you can enlarge the ramp. And if you are interested in using this ramp to diagnose chaos, well, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, here you see the advantage of using balance gain and loss uh, because you know, something that could be easily confused here with not clear well, this is a ramp. Now it becomes a ramp and this is, you know, the same, same slope is the same ramp. Uh, the ramp has not been changed. We can understand how what's the value of the plateau at long times. We have an expression, analytical expression, which fits neatly. But what is important here is that we can use balance gain and loss to increase this uh, the extension of the ramp and uh, enhance manifestations of chaos. Uh, it was already discussed in the literature and this work by uh, Bismarck and Prosen that the amplitude of the ramp. Uh, tell us essentially, you know, it's, it's a manifestation of chaos. So let us look at how much the amplitude of the ramp can vary. And uh, this is something uh, that is shown here. I plot the ratio, the ratio between the plateau time and the deep time. So this is the ratio between the plateau time, the onset of the plateau, and the onset of the deep. And I'm going to show this as a function of the dissipation strength. So I can show you that, <clears throat> you know, essentially for any given beta, I can enhance uh, the, the extension of the ramp until a given value after which it decays. But what is important is the enhancement I can have here, you know, so for given, you know, given value of beta, I'm enhancing, you know, by several orders of magnitude up, up to two orders of magnitude, the extension of the ramp. So this, you know, this little ramp becomes two orders of magnitude larger uh, when, when I do this uh, uh, spectral filtering uh, that naturally is induced by balance gain and loss. So this is the, the main point, you know, we can use this balance gain and loss to, to enhance uh, spectral correlations. Um, you know, and maybe this is just complementary, you know, you may wonder whether balance gain and loss within a lead facing is special or not, you know, are there better filters of the spectrum that can enhance even further uh, the uh, correlations between eigenvalues? And the answer is there are no better filters uh, of this form. So, you know, we have seen that essentially balance gain and loss is tantamount to a Gaussian filter. Uh, so you may consider other kind of filters and uh, where now you vary delta, you know, you make the filter exponential or hyper Gaussian. And what you see is that uh, they actually alter, either alter the shape of the spectrum or, you know, or, or, or yes, uh, are, are not, uh, you know, so, so, so the optimal one here is, is the one which appears under balance gain and loss. This is here. It gives rise to the maximum uh, ramp of the spectrum and it does not affect its slope. Other filters, either with the smaller or larger values of delta, uh, change the slope. That means they are changing eigenvalue correlations and they are hiding uh, the, the physics of the system uh, that we want to, to study. Yeah. So actually, uh, balance gain and, and loss here for energy defacing here is, is pretty un unique as the optimal filter. Uh, of the spectral uh, correlations. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I guess, I guess with this, I, I close. You know, we have, I have motivated uh, energy defacing as a model of decoherence. Uh, we introduced this idea of extreme decoherence, uh, looking at the uh, scaling of the decoherence time with the system size. And then uh, I moved to quantum chaos and I argue uh, for a fidelity based approach to uh, extend the notions of the spectral form factor. In open systems, which could be Hermitian or not, um, we look how uh, I mentioned briefly that the arbitrary defacing kills chaos completely. So only energy defacing gives rise to a gradual suppression of chaos. This is what we saw. But what is interesting, you know, so, so and contrary to the intuition, what we people expect is that any open system suppresses chaos. Uh, here, non-Hermitian dynamics with balance and gain, balance gain and loss. Uh, enhances uh, quantum correlations and quantum chaos. Yeah? So this is actually the only case I know where uh, 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 dissipative dynamics gives rise to an enhancement of eigenvalue correlations. And, for, and we have further shown that this is actually an optimal filter. So with this I close, you know, so I guess I thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? I have a question on your effective Hamiltonian. You 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 selected this as h zero plus i gamma h zero squared. Is is that somehow motivated? I mean, seems a yeah. strange choice. 
Yeah, well, it, it, you see, so so what I'm doing is following the you know, standard quantum open systems. I do have a Lindblad master equation mm. where the dissipator is of Lindblad form. It includes the quantum jump part and the anti-commutator. And I generally have always this structure of the anti of the effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. It's my system mm. Hamiltonian. Mm. That's the something that is a Lindblad operator, dagger, you know, Lindblad operator. Now, when I choose the Lindblad operators to be the Hamiltonian themselves, and so it's Hermitian, so then I do have this very simple uh, structure, which I have here. But essentially what I'm saying is, you know, I, I take energy phasing, which in the uh, second part of the talk, we saw that it suppresses chaos, but now I condition it to absence of jumps, of quantum jumps. And I get this no Hermitian dynamics, which enhances chaos. You see, so it's, a, it's an interesting interplay where we completely uh, associate uh, 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 how quantum jumps uh, are the responsible ones in suppression. Uh, is, is the part of the master equation that suppresses mm. the eigenvalue correlations. While if you actually remove them, you get that the correlations between eigenvalues are enhanced. Oh. It says this doesn't seem to be even PT symmetric, no? It's not PT symmetric, right? So, yeah, but you know, it's a very simple no Hermitian Hamiltonian. Yes. Uh, yeah, but but yeah. most people here are interested in in PT symmetric Hamiltonians. So, so I'm I'm not sure how that fits. Yeah, it's an op it's a, it's a non Hermitian Hamiltonian. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Course. Yeah, yeah, it may, it may, it may not. Fit, yeah, but I haven't, mm -hmm. I haven't touched on PT symmetry. You know, so so mm -hmm. the, the angle I'm I'm taking is really focusing on on uh, filtering mm -hmm. the uh, uh, the uh, eigenvalue correlation. So you know, mm -hmm. the setting was mm -hmm. the historical one. I, I went back to the early works from the 80s, from Levy and there, from you know Rafa Levy and so on, where they you know given a set of eigenvalues, you know real points on a line. I take the Fourier transform. And I try to infer from that whether the system is chaotic or integrable or not. Then we ask the question how this analysis is altered by the presence of the coherence, which mm. inevitably you have in experiments. Mm. And then whether we can fight the coherence by making some kind of um, filtering, in this case, conditioning to the absence of quantum jumps, uh, provided that we have, for instance, uh, the ability to do continuous quantum measurements. And then this is what justifies this kind of dynamics, which is mm. non-hermitian. Yeah, I, I, I have not gone into or this is pretty symmetric, and from that point of view, you, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you may say that yes, the talk is a bit maybe out of the uh, 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 focus of the seminar series. In that case, I, I just no. I'm just trying to understand yeah. because it's hard to see where the gain and loss comes from. Yeah, if the, if it's, the gain and loss is something like name. It's it's appearing pragmatically under the name of gain and loss. Maybe. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, you, 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 you know, you look at the, uh, you look at this uh, non Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, you t take the trace of the uh, of the density the, of the derivative of the density matrix. Uh, you will see uh, it's not preserved. Uh, the, there is a rate of change at which you are mm -hmm. loss barring the norm, either with gains or losses. And then you know you, you don't have this term. Yeah? Uh, then you you say you know I don't like to have this non trace preserving. Dynamics. Uh, mm. If I look at the sub ensemble of trajectories, I want to have a consistent quantum mechanics within this quant with this ensemble of trajectories. So mm. then I do enforce uh, 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 I do enforce norm preservation. And you know, again, this is not my take. You know, this is a completely established uh, approach in the theory of uh, stochastic unraveling of master equations of, of, of you know of continuous monitoring or continuous measurements of master equations. Actually, for any open system, I can always mm -hmm. employ this formulation. You know, a, if you wish it's a matter of language, yes, but I can always uh, unravel a master equation in terms of stochastic trajectories with quantum jumps. No, right? And I can always identify trajectories that have some properties. Either they are full mm -hmm. of jumps, they have no jumps, they have K jumps. You know, I, I can always do this post selection. If I condition of no no jumps at all is when I, I and then I enforce norm preservation is when I am back mm -hmm. to this uh, norm. And again, this equation was introduced already, you know, decades ago. Uh, it is and an, and it is uh, the one you get in PT symmetric with broken PT symmetry, uh, uh, as as pointed out in in this work. Yeah. Uh, actually, the connection was not pointed out in this work. Uh, I, this is what I point out. Yeah, I hear there's a question of Miroslav. Miroslav. 
because you are making a connection between balanced gain and loss and uh, no jumps condition, which leads to nonlinearity. I am puzzled by this emergence of nonlinearity. When you have this original equation, okay, master equation, linear in uh, density matrix, then suddenly no jumps condition, which is sort of mysterious, goes not only to balance between gain and loss, but also to nonlinearity, quadratic dependence of the uh, right hand side of the evolution equation. So there's something which is puzzling. Yeah, but not that much, you know. So I agree. They, I, we start with a trace preserving, you know, master equation canonical. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, I mean, there's no, no jump condition. There's no jump condition. It's something which emerges in a mysterious way. Well, it just it, it's a matter of language, you know. You you can just you can ascribe a meaning to this density matrix as the ensemble of trajectories where the number of quantum jumps goes from zero to infinity. Yeah? And now you post select a given subsection of subfamily of these trajectories in which, for instance, you don't have to do it in this way, but for instance, you can consider that there are no quantum jumps ever. Yeah? Uh -huh, so and then it's when you can kill this term and you get a, this kind of you no know, Hermitian Hamiltonian and then you can enforce no, uh, trace preservation. So Let me point like out uh, sorry, let me finish. Let me point out that experimentally this has already been done by, uh, you know, from, you, you may be familiar with the famous work from uh, Dave Wineland, where, you, you know, they monitor quantum jumps in an ion trap, you know, in a, in a two level system. And, uh, you know, so then there are the works by Irfan Siddiqui uh, of Michel de Boret. So, you know, this is something that in the lab can be done, you know. So you monitor a, a given system uh, through a sequence of weak measurements. And this allows you to tell whether in a single experimental run, you do have jumps or not, because you can actually visualize these jumps. And once you have finished the experiment, it is up to you to say, I'm going to, you know, I reduced hundreds of thousand times, and now I can say, no, I, I consider all trajectories. Then you have to describe that ensemble of trajectories with the initial density matrix. Yeah, I but you could say, I can throw away a given number of trajectories, and then it's when we get into this business of conditioning the dynamics on a, a sequence mm. of events, on a measurement record. And this is what allows you, this is what makes the dynamics nonlinear, uh, you know, because, you know, it's, we are, you are, you are, it's a post selection. The dynamics has happened. You filter it according to some measurement record. And, you know, so this guy yeah, yeah, to the nonlinearity. Yeah. There's a beautiful discussion of how this, uh, okay. in, in, in this book about Thank how you. this nonlinearity appears. Thank you. Most welcome. Any more comments, questions? If not, uh, then um, let's uh, thank Adolfo again. Thank you very much, Adolfo. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.